And again, for the newest pe newer people, uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm George Parrott, and I'm coming back to point position for the EV group uh, after a forced hiatus for the last two months plus. And I'd normally like to be standing up and moving around more. But again, as many of you know, uh, I was taken out by a careless motorist. Had he had a smart EV, the EV would have seen that I was a pedestrian in a crosswalk, and he never looked. And so I'm three months into my rehab and doing, by my surgeon's standards, very well. By my standards, it's frustratingly long. But again, the trajectory's in the, in the right direction. I want to thank Guy, Peter Macken, the rest of the board. Can I have other board members stand up? Uh, because you guys have been doing yeoman work over the last two months in my sort of break. <laughs> okay, so here's the program for tonight. Um, we basically <laughs> have um, two highlight speakers in terms of cutting edge um, programs in our area. And then we get to the program highlight with a hands-on in three dimensions and physical presence, because hiding in the back room <laughs> is one of the few 2018 Nissan LEAF vehicles currently in the United States. Um, OK, so moving on. And let's see if this all works. There we go. So highlights of some of the upcoming <coughs> excitement in the <coughs> EV world. Um, the Tokyo International Auto Show was one of those events. I actually flew to Tokyo in 2009 for a long weekend <laughs> just to see, Owen, you should be hearing this, just to see the debut of the original Nissan LEAF. <laughs> and, and we had VIN number 320 LEAF in the world. Um, it's an incredible show. And had I not been sidelined with this pelvic fracture, I probably would have gone because it's always fun to be in Tokyo. <laughs> anyway, um, much to many of our kind of frustration and disgust, Mitsubishi has shown us these great concept cars and in some cases practical, like the SU plug-in SUV, and never brought them to the United States. But they had two or three neat new concept cars. This one, they're Mitsubishi E Evolution is kind of a halfway between an SUV and a big sedan. So they're still trying to excite us. Now, Toyota had some really far out stuff. Uh, this thing is designed to be basically completely self driving. Um, will we ever see something like this? Well, those of you that are younger than I will see it. Maybe not me. I was excited about this because, I mean, I have a Tesla Model S, and my one niggle is it's way too big. I would like something small and fun and electric. And certainly this little Honda Sports EV fits that kind of a direction. So the little asides there are my comments. Build it, and I'll buy it. <laughs> and then Nissan, <coughs> this is probably a little far out for what we'll see tonight, but Nissan's still showing cutting edge concepts over there. I mean, at times, there's only been a couple of EV concepts shown. Tokyo had eight or nine. So that's promising that the major players are actually working in this domain. And then here's a more practical version of that little Honda, kind of as Owen was observing when he was going through these slides. I mean, I had one of the original Honda Civics back in the 19 to early 70s. And this is reminiscent of that. I mean, it's, it's just cute. <laughs> now this next one, see, now notice my little aside. This is what I needed over the last couple of months. Because getting in and out of my Tesla, even now that I'm driving and, and early on, is oh, just agony, because I still can't really move my right leg very well. It's hard getting out of it with your regular, you know, yeah. you're in good shape. <laughs> yeah, but this one comes with the deluxe wheelchair. Yeah. <laughs> Which was a pretty cool addition. So sometimes, you know, in these concept cars, they're showing neat little add-ons. That's a little segue to one of the vehicles coming up. This one. Because this one comes with a drone. 
It's a delivery vehicle, and the concept here is that while the delivery person is at one house in a neighborhood, they can launch the drone to deliver somewhere else and save personnel time for that second stop. We, gotta, we have to keep people employed for some reason. <coughs> Do the whole thing with a drone. <laughs> yeah. I'm a big science fiction fan, so you know, let the, let the robots work and we can sit around and think. But then again, that's my academic <laughs> psyche, <laughs> which is mostly what I did for the last 40 years. And anybody who knew me sort of thought that that's what was going on. And um, one of our members, I don't know if they're here tonight, you know, is really excited about the fact that there's an upcoming pickup. I mean, Tesla is promising a pickup too, but these guys are already there. And you know, a practical pickup for delivery and service makes a lot <coughs> of sense because you can also have uh, power output for equipment that you may need on site for particular work. And then back to the more realistic domain, here's three of the, I'm going to call them spy shots that I took two weeks ago when I made a trip down to the Tesla employee parking lots at Fremont. And um, I sent these photos to, I, I'm a contributing writer for Green Car Reports and I sent them to Green Car Reports and my editor there who was really happy to get them, but he pointed out that he suggested using them without any source because that uh, employee parking lot is private property <laughs> and basically I really shouldn't have been on it. <laughs> but we can see, and I did have a red one too, there were, there were four different Model 3s from employees in that work shift. So at least it confirms that in fact Tesla's getting those cars out to their employees and you know, they really felt good. <laughs> <laughs> now if we could only get them. And then here's a little local news for Tesla people. Um, if you haven't been there with your Tesla, we now have a Central City Tesla supercharger station with 10 chargers right off of Truxell and Freeway Boulevard. Um, and as an FYI, two things. One, when your car is charging and you go across the street for a meal, I do not recommend the Indian restaurant. <laughs> Tried it, won't go back. But two doors down is a spectacular good Mexican restaurant. And there's also a beachfront deli. Uh, but the Indian restaurant gets a pass. <laughs> Shalimar, yeah. Do you agree? Or <laughs> I hope you don't own it. I was there, I mean, uh, and I was there like last week in front of like that side. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So I go there once in a while and I know them. Their food still comes from uh, Bay Area. Mm. Because now I'm hardening, so we should cook there, right? We should cook be from there. Oh. And just yeah, so I that. agree with him. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, yeah. <laughs> they have many. But uh, my one yeah, question no, is that why they put right. 10 stations on that parking lot? Why not in front of? They, you know, they go where they can get free yeah, property. Okay, right, right. And, you know, again, I, on the food recommendations, <laughs> um, as a white guy, you know, you want to be skeptical about judgments of other ethnic <laughs> options. Um, but thank you for at least <laughs> coming in. <laughs> but Indian is one of my favorite cuisines, and this one was a, a disappointment. There's three good Indian restaurants, at least, in, in West Sacramento. Shalimar doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is one that um, I should have segued it in earlier as a concept car, but it actually, those others all came from Tokyo. Um, because I have sort of counterfeit but acceptable press credentials, I'm on the press distribution list for the LA Auto Show coming up. And this came out just today in an email from <coughs> BMW. This car, w it, it was shown in Europe, but it's, it will be here in the LA Auto Show at the end of the month. Wow. And this is clearly a Tesla Model S competitor. Um, the specs, the design, the physical size. Um, and again, it just highlights that BMW is truly serious about this marketplace, the EV marketplace.
kind of an ex um, they're saying they didn't say batteries, but they're claiming 600 kilometers, 373 miles. That'd be on the European circuit, so probably 250, 260 on U.S. because our testing circuit. So that's still right there in Model S territory. I mean, that's the problem. I mean, that's the total problem. There, yes, there's there's some discussions. Um, I hadn't picked up any of that, but several of the companies are in collaboration to extend a fast charging network. But you know, for all of us kind of shopping, and I'm a one car household because it's just me as a widower. And right now, because of the supercharger network, Tesla's got my attention because I want a car that I can drive from here to Michigan and other, you know, road trips. And right now, these other guys, as Aunt Randy, you're pointing out, until they really get their act together, I mean, I love the looks of the Porsche Mission E, <laughs> but, you know, unless there's a charging network. As you keep on with that more and more mileage like that, Five. It's and again. I mean, my Tesla charges in. I mean, I never let it get low, lower than about fifty miles. Yeah. But so I was so. About this one four hours. Three, yeah. You would probably let it go down more because you got more miles. Maybe. I mean, well, my, ho my home. That's based on Europe. Too. Yeah, that's based on Europe. Th that's probably so the U.S. To Model S. Yeah, the the U.S. numbers for that car would be about two sixty. The European and Japanese standards for certifying range are way more generous. Oh. Uh, from our board report, uh, we've set the general meeting agenda for next year, um, every other month starting in January. Uh, what we're doing here is redirecting our intense promotional activities to um, April with Earth Month rather than what we've been trying to do in September uh, because the September date in Sacramento is just too environmentally painful to get people to stand around and look at cars <laughs> at 100 to 105 degrees. So we'll, we'll be available to help any SMUD or anybody <laughs> else that wants to have a September event, but we will simply have our own general meeting in September and not have any National Drive Electric Week emphasis on our part when it's so darn hot still. Jennifer Vanima from Sac City. Yeah. Hi. Good to see you all again. Thanks for having me. I believe the last time I came, we were talking high-level EV issues. What we're thinking about as the city started to look at developing the first electric vehicle strategy for the city. So this document has been completed in a draft form and it is now available online for anyone to pull up and take a look at, to share your thoughts with us. We are very excited. We've had a lot of engagement, uh, most notably with, with board members here from the SAC EV Association, um, also with input from other agencies and stakeholders. Um, and we're very excited. We really want your feedback. The way the strategy is laid out is it takes the very high level goals for EV adoption in the general plan and it provides a more actionable framework of what the city is going to actually try to do to implement that goal and it provides some recommended targets. Actions are proposed in the plan around these six general categories, but I think what's really notable here is we are trying to set some benchmarks by which the city would then evaluate progress towards with the overarching goal of increasing zero emission vehicle access and usership, ridership throughout the community. On October 19th, when we released the strategy, we had a community workshop really exceeded our expectations in terms of the number of folks that came. So a big thank you to a good number of you guys in the room who did come to listen and to share feedback. These are just a few pictures from that event 
over 55 individuals did come and that was our first workshop to really kick off this conversation. The strategy is a start of a conversation. It's again establishing targets but identifying those areas that we want to work together with the community, with our stakeholders to actually achieve. In the near term, we are also providing a few other opportunities for input. If you are currently registered in the city's EV parking program, you hopefully received an email asking for your feedback on the current incentives we give through that program to EV drivers. Certain garages you can get free or reduced parking and we want to take stock of how the program's working for individuals. How could it work better? We will also be distributing that through the EV Association for additional feedback from EV drivers about what incentives individuals would like to see. You should also expect to get more surveys and more requests for input, perhaps through stakeholder groups. I believe Guy and other individuals may be soon sharing an update. SMUD is doing a workplace charging study. They'll be conducting some focus groups to provide recommendations on workplace charging issues. UC Davis also has some funds to do a deeper dive of EV issues and preferences within the region. So we're looking forward to updates on that. And with that, in terms of our timing, we will be accounting for public comment through November. We've requested public comments on the strategy by November 15th. You can find that online. We are taking the strategy to council. However, there is a lot of high priority cannabis items that <laughs> are taking over the agenda on November 28th. So we've had to push out our time frame. We will not get back to council until December 12th, which gives us more time. It's helpful. And then in early 2018, that's when we anticipate starting a lot of our more proactive engagement. And we're also hoping there's more engagement around the Volkswagen settlement at that time. So that concludes my presentation. Happy for comments or questions. There was one thing missing on the survey. You didn't mention anything about signage in the parking garages. Oh. Changing from the eight to five limit to 24 hours. That's a great, that's there a great. There are a lot of people who park at the one at uh, Power. Well, yes, well, that's the only one you can still park for free. But the one across from Music Circus. Mm, the you pull in memorial. there and expect to get a charging station, and there's somebody sitting with a big, giant uh, internal combustion engine truck because it's after 5 p.m. Mm. And I did put a note on the survey asking if you would add that for changing the yeah. parking signs to say 24 hours electric vehicles only. Since money was spent to put those charging stations yeah. in, they shouldn't be blocked. They shouldn't be iced. Thank you for flagging that. That's a that's a very helpful note. Uh, sorry, uh, reliability issue. Mm -hmm. uh, two charge point locations, which the city supports in the jury parking lot and at the police station on Freeport, mm -hmm. have been out of service um, on and off for about a couple months. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll take a look at that. So. Kind of how I check the reliability of charging stations is the plug share. Do you guys like look at that as well to try to see if you reach out to charge point or what have you? Yeah. Them? You know, that's a good that's a good question. So I have not checked recently. A lot of how we respond is it's complaint driven when when our facilities managers or others call in. Mm -hmm. So that's actually a helpful suggestion. Yeah, because I mean that's how I would about it or yeah. critique, be like, oh, that's getting iced or what have you. So, mm. um, whatever that third one is. Another thank you. <laughs> so, thank you very much. My name is Delphine from the California ISO. I'm pleased to be here to present to you all uh, enthusiastic electric vehicle uh, or um, clean vehicle owners. And so I'll go through a brief introduction about the California ISO, but I want to focus on the end of what it means to you all in particular. First is question, I haven't even started. Working? It says it's on. Thing. So yeah, that's for there. So you want to, as a speaker, you want to speak to the people in the back of the room. Okay. Just raise your voice. All right. Take two. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. So a little bit about 
what the California independent system operator is, or more broadly, what an independent system operator is. Most of you get your electricity, you turn your lights on, and you don't care, and that's the end of the question. Um, but what happened quite a few years ago is there was a push to deregulate, to try to get more competition into the electricity industry, and that really started with wanting more renewables on the system. Um, and so there was a big push federally, but also within certain states like California, sort of uh, higher cost states, California, especially on the East Coast, in New York, New England, that area, that they wanted to see more competition. But how do you do that? In a <coughs> country like the UK, you go and you nationalize everything, but in the US, that wasn't gonna work. So what we had was instead of sort of a in-between <coughs> uh, agreement. Utilities such as PG&E, such as Southern California Edison, they retain ownership of all the wires and the generation that you see in the state. What happens is an independent system operator steps in and what we do is we n just operate the system. We don't own the high voltage transmission lines, but we operate it and we uh, look at connecting resources neutrally. What does that mean? It means we don't own any of the generation, we don't own any of the transmission, so we're not biased <coughs> towards anything. If you want to connect more renewables, if you want to connect other resources, we do that based on reliability and engineering. Peter. And, and in addition, you don't own the electricity either. That's correct, we don't own the electricity. So that brings up another important mm -hmm. point. So our main tenet is <coughs> a reliability. We want to make sure the lights stay on. But as Peter mentioned, uh, we don't own the electricity. What we have is a market. You can almost think of us as the stock exchange of electricities. There are buyers, there are sellers. We create a platform where they come together and they try to buy electricity that they need at the lowest price. So the last thing uh, mentioned here was, again, the independent transmission planning and generator interconnection. We're here in California. We're somewhat lonely here. Ignore those orange uh, spots, but largely that's just us in California here. Most of it's green, but our sister organizations are actually up in Canada and out to the East Coast. So again, most of these independent system operators were created because of high prices, but because they wanted to foster more competition in the system. A little <coughs> bit specifically about the California uh, independent system operator where I work. We're a not-for-profit public benefits <coughs> corporation. Um, we do operate through about 80% of the state. We have 30 million customers, miles and miles of transmission lines, lots and lots of generation, including lots of lots of renewables, uh, and much more solar penetration than almost any other footprint in the US. Uh, and we transact $9 billion through our market. Again, we don't keep the money. Uh, we charge a little bit for the convenience of having the market, but overall, we're not for profit. Yes. We're about 80%. 80%. Yeah, that's right. So again, I think many of you have a technical background, so I won't get too uh, into this. I do not. I was fascinated when I started researching this. Every time I turned the lights on, it turned on. It was really amazing, <laughs> because that's exactly what the independent system operators and all the operators for electricity do, is they make sure there's an exact supply and demand balance. As you all know from electric vehicle owners, you can store that electricity in your vehicle. But for the most part, when you're looking at these transmission lines out there, that kind of large scale storage doesn't exist. Or if it does, like the Tesla Powerwall, it's very, very expensive. So really, what we rely on today are folks like the system operators that every time you flip a light switch, you get that electricity. So it's that instantaneous balance. Now, the world is changing, so we might have larger scale storage. Our sort of old school storage is like pumped hydro storage, um, but again, few and far in between. So we still rely on that very minute balance. We do that via two operation centers. They operate 24 hours a day. I heard that folks are interested in a tour, so we'd love to have you up there, maybe during a weekday. <laughs> <laughs> um, but again, these are just pictures of our operations floor, 24 hour coverage, and we work very closely with our neighboring systems, neighboring states. Now, uh, SMUD is not an official member of the California ISO, but we work very closely with them, mostly because we're inside of them. Um, we're in SMUD territory, whoops. Um, but again, <laughs> it works fine. And uh, highly, skin, uh, highly skilled personnel, we get, <laughs> if you noticed, there are no windows in these operating rooms. We get a lot of our employees that were formal um, submarine employees, <laughs> like <laughs> naval submarine employees. Um, they do a great job. <laughs> so here is where it gets interesting. We operate a market. So 
what does that mean? That means on our system, there is a price for electricity every five minutes. I'm pretty sure when you get your electricity bill at the end of the day, you don't ever think that's possible because you don't ever see that. By the time that rate becomes a retail rate on your bill, you will never see the ups and downs of our market. You don't have to look at the actual words, but just look at the colors. So on this particular day, I just picked a random day in July. This is from our app, which I'm plugging because that's how I get paid. Um, we have prices that go from negative, negative prices to positive, negative 50 to over 200. How is that possible? The idea is our market is sending out a signal for electricity. If the prices are high, we're saying we need electricity, but not only do we need electricity, we need it exactly there, <coughs> that dot. We have 4,000 nodes in California alone modeled on our system because we understand how electricity flows. If you think of the highway, how long is it gonna take you going somewhere on Route 80 at 5 p.m. versus 3 a.m.? So there's a different cost for that congestion. It's the same thing on the electricity system. In this picture, don't have to look at the numbers, just look at the colors. Green, things are good on the system. Prices are pretty low. Where it hits orange or red, not good. We need electricity. But what gets really interesting are the negative prices, and I'll get into that a little bit. Um, last part, a little bit back on our transmission planning. So again, we do plan uh, very closely with, uh, not only for reliability, but with state policy to support renewables, for economics um, to reduce costs, and we do work with a lot of the state agencies to make sure uh, we're adhering to that. Um, what might be interesting, we call this our, our duck curve. The idea is that we have so much solar in our state in the middle of the day that we have more solar than we have a need for that electricity. So what's happening is that our net load is actually dipping down in the middle of the day. So I heard the words that I always love to hear, <coughs> workplace charging for electric vehicles. That's a good idea because the way our prices work out in our market, which you guys, well, I'll skip that one, which you guys don't see, is these are our lowest prices right in the middle of the day. So in our market, when we're sending out signals to the market, please respond, give us more electricity or give us less. What we're saying is we're getting so much solar right here, our prices are going negative. And what that means is please stop giving us electricity. <laughs> Just take it. We, we want you to take it so much, we will pay you to take it. A positive number means we're paying someone to get electricity. A negative number means take my money because you need to take my electricity with you. So it doesn't, so, but the point of that is it doesn't cause reliability issues on the grid. We cannot have our lines damaged and we will do what we can to protect those facilities that we operate and make sure that we don't have a situation where we have, uh, in the worst scenario, blackout, but also instability on the grid, yes. They actually come in two flavors. They're system-wide, meaning there's enough uh, renewables across the state at a fairly uniform rate that the whole state can go negative, or in what we call constrained areas, especially where we do have a lot of <coughs> solar penetration, and those areas, if the electricity can't get pushed out elect uh, effectively, then that those particular areas will go negative. And so they it depends on the flows on that day. So our biggest problems are on spring weekends where we have very little load. It's not that hot. We don't have air conditioning running. We don't have businesses or you know offices um, up and running. So we do see this pattern is, is much more pronounced on those days, on holidays, weekends. Yes? Basically, you give it free to PG&E. You don't give it free to us. Yeah, because PG&E charges peak. <laughs> yes. Well, it depends. Well, to all of the load-serving entities. So yes, it might go through PG&E. We do still have direct access customers, and now more and more so, we have community choice aggregators. They're poised at this point at PG&E territory. They've taken away about 25 percent of the PG&E load, and they're poised to they're poised to move that up to about 60 percent in about a decade or so. Yes. Okay. This is a very important point about reconciling wholesale Correct. rates with retail tariffs. Correct. And unless you have a special pass-through of the wholesale price signals to us, 
you won't get any change. Correct. So there's a pilot going on. I, th I actually think it's in Southern California. I can't recall if it's San Diego or Southern California. They have a pilot right now. And I, I didn't, they had to explain this to me. I didn't realize this. They, it's named by salsa. It's mild, medium, and spicy. <laughs> so they have a spicy rate, which what it does is it looks at the Kaiso's day ahead prices and it sees this pattern. And it feeds that information to your electric vehicle and says, when would you like to charge? If they have a pattern of your usage that usually you're sitting at work and the car is just sitting in the parking lot, they'll charge here and try to use that negative pricing. If you're driving around, maybe they'll charge here overnight when you're not. But that was the, the spicy rate, so that pilot is running, and we'll see how vehicle owners feel about that. Yeah, the problem I see is that the, the utilities actually encourage us to, to charge yes. between midnight and 5 a.m., yeah. yep. which is when you, there's excess power. Uh, however, you have excess power in the midday Correct. because of all the solar oh, generation. Yeah. Yeah. My personal <laughs> solution is I have a power wall, and I keep that power and use it in the evening. And that flattens out my model, but it mm -hmm. doesn't help your model. Well, it actually does help you. It model. does, yeah. Uh, but that's kind of the direction we need to go in is where we're using, we're encouraging people to charge their cars midday by having a, a lower rate then, not at nighttime. Preaching to the choir here. <laughs> <laughs> at least Agreed. Less socialized. Yes. <laughs> yes. So our, our, our purpose is really just to. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize, okay. So our purpose really is for us to manage the oversupply that we have is when we have too much power pushing into our system, when we have the negative pricing, is to have sort of a suite of solutions. So there's no silver bullet, but certainly you guys are on our minds. So electric vehicles, um, as that grows in the state because of either both state mandates and goals, but certainly because of a market push. I mean, we can see it very clearly. I think we're, we're quite proud to have the electric vehicle penetration we have in California, but I think there's even more than that in China, and it's very quiet. Um, so there's going to be a global push on the electric vehicle side, I think in a similar way there was for solar panels. So we're thinking that in preparing for that, what we would like is at minimum, the CAISO is already sending out pricing signals for when the best time to use and not use electricity exists. Um, but we do hope that working with state regulators, with other stakeholders, that we can connect that wholesale to retail pricing signaling. Um, so again, workplace charging sounds to us like the way to go, but maybe that's not. I've heard a lot of people say, well, no, we should all have power walls and save the electricity and people can charge when they go home. That's fine too. But the idea is all we need to do is align the consumption with the pricing, no matter how we do it, whatever technologies we use to do it, we're just hoping that the signal is accurate enough to drive that incentive there. So um, hopefully that was a, oh, yes. Uh, from your viewpoint, Kathleen, uh, uh, are you at all Concerned or, or anxious about the increase in the uh, the public going toward EVs? Do you think the grid is capable of, of handling that and balancing that out with the challenges in front of you? Well, actually, I was at the uh, California Energy Commission today, and we were looking at their electric vehicle survey. At this point, most people seem to be charging overnight, so that's not an issue. So, and again, we we do want some electricity usage overnight because there is still a significant amount of wind penetration in the state and that's not always being used. Um, but yes, we will be very concerned if one fine day we have two, three million electric vehicles in the state and everyone wants to plug in at 6 p.m. So that will be a big concern for us. But we're trying to, to get the message and get the word out now so that we're prepared for if that should happen. 2025 when we have the 1.5 million We do, so we work pretty closely with the California Energy Commission and the, the major utilities, but also increasingly with the community choice aggregators to understand, A, what their electric vehicle penetration is, what kinds, is it hybrid, is it full battery, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, fuel, fuel cell, just speaking not on behalf of the ISO, but that's kind of what I'm hoping for, is for, for that technology to also take off. Um, that's still sort of in the horizon, but that is part of the forecasting, so we are looking at that as well. What about car to grid? 
Car to Grid is it's it's interesting. We actually we we talk a lot with our German uh, grid operator counterparts and there are providers in Germany that are very very impressive with that technology. For us, we haven't been able to get that off the ground yet, but what what I'm really hoping for is let's walk before we run. I still would like folks to charge at the appropriate time if some fine day folks want to give up their car batteries and use it for some service in the CAISO, we can talk about that later. But at this point, we have barriers like avoids your car battery warranty. Um, I think PG&E and BMW just did a pilot, and it was extremely successful, but I think all the BMW owners got paid quite a lot of money to participate. <laughs> so I don't know if that's an enduring model for success. Can you over in Europe that they have the ones that are doing the grid, the car grid? Yeah, they have, they have a lot more sophisticated, uh, both technology and participation. Mm -hmm. Okay. One, just one last question, we need to transition. Okay, okay it's more of, a, more of a comment, just to address what Guy was saying. And Delphine knows this too, but if there ever was such a situation where everybody came on, plugged in their EVs at 6 p.m. and said charge, the ISO has uh, systems in place to basically shed some of that load and keep the grid from collapsing. So it would not happen except if somebody did that, but you know, some people would. Yeah. But but you know we can't see your house, so it's it's <coughs> indiscriminate. So Correct. if we shed load him, it's not just your car. <laughs> <laughs> it's your dinner too. Yeah. Um, so she has offered to provide a tour to the um, of the ISO operations center. If it were a midday on a work day, how many? Just to get a sense of interest, how many? If I raise my hand. How many people would be interested in going to see no. yeah, A work day, there. not a weekend, not an evening. No <laughs> rain this time. <laughs> no rain this time. <laughs> Thank you. Middle of, middle of July, right around the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just for the two slices of pizza that he gets. <laughs> 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 Especially since I'm cleaning up after. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let me just open up some quick material here. I think in the interest of time, there's a really cool video that I was going to show, but I think in the interest of time, I think we'll just uh, save that for later in case people want to see it. It's from the Las Vegas launch event where we had it. There's some beautiful graphics in it. But no, since it's 320, no, no, sorry, 970 megabytes. I'm thinking no. <laughs> Uh, actually, no, it's more than that. I was wrong. Yeah, it's 791 megabytes. So if you can email that, you <laughs> go for it. <laughs> All right. So um, as I say, in the interest of that, I think I'm going to skip that portion of it. Okay. And we're just going to skip over that. And we're going to skip over that. There we go. So that was the reveal video. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to go past that. So um, I'm going to skip to the slide portion. Again, if people would like to see the video later, I'm happy to show it to you. I just know that there's probably, there's probably a car back that you'd rather see the real thing rather than a video of the real thing. So uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to everyone. Thank you for everyone coming uh, to here, not only for tonight, for the many events that you do from Stack EV. And um, who are my LEAF owners here? How many do we? I'm going to say current, and then I'll branch out. Okay, so let's say current leaf owners. How many are we? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We have a bevy of assortment of things, but I'm not sure that we have ten. So it's first person. No, wait a minute. How we do? Well, we may have to go in triage order, like who got their car first or something. We'll we'll figure out some we'll figure out some equitable way in which we can we can distribute the uh, the swag that Kamasos uh, uh, here uh, kindly brought for us. That's yeah, something like that. We'll we'll work on it. So, uh, but first of all, I want to say thank you for everyone uh, for being here tonight. And it's not just for tonight; it's for the last seven years. Uh, the leaf success is uh, uh, is a story that no one thought would ever materialize, and that's uh, due in large part to folks like yourself who are here tonight, and folks like um, us, uh, kind of all over the world, who make that car uh, possible. We're over uh, 280,000. I think it's more 290,000, closing in on 300,000 Leafs now uh, globally. It is by far the world's best-selling EV that has ever been. Um, Tesla's giving us a run for our money, but we're happy to see that. That's okay. Um, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna see the car in question a little bit later. But first, I want to um, just introduce the car itself. So I'm gonna do. Um, 
a little bit of mix of items here. I put this together about five minutes before you came, so let's um, <laughs> let's go with it. Um, so I want to I want to keep this word in mind. Okay, I want to keep this perspective in mind about the value. It's a really key element in the positioning of the vehicle and why we chose the certain things we did. So that that word should hopefully be kind of emblazoned into your mind here shortly. <coughs> So we're going to get to that in just a moment. I'm going to go one, one step back. So first about the value part. So um, this is a balance for many different factors. We can bring you lots of certain things. It's a question of what's the best balance for value, and that's where we're focused. So for this particular car, it's about the style, the functionality, the range, the safety, the technology, and ultimately the price, ultimately the price. So our goal in this is to have a vehicle that's affordable and with a, with a range that's meaningful. So in the case of this particular next car that's coming out very, very soon, it's now um, 150 miles real world range is the target and under $30,000. And I can guarantee you those are two numbers that didn't belong together in the same sentence even a few years ago. So it's an amazing progress. Um, so let's talk about the performance. I'm sorry? That's before incentives. That is before incentives. Wow. So uh, a couple of new numbers I'm going to say. So let's start with the performance. Um, so it's 37 por 37% more power, 20%, 26% more torque, and the, uh, the familiar sort of EV smile, the off the line, is now a bit more rigorous, and it's 15% uh, faster in the zero to 60, particularly in the mid-range is where so the, mid, the big um, benefit's been made. Uh, there's the lower half of the car. A third increase in the energy density. The actual package size is very similar to the current car. And we're going to talk about the advanced safety that should all sort of load on itself. Um, so we're going to let those load in. But the, a couple of the big stories, I'm just going to pick up on a couple of items here. And one of those is about the e-pedal, which some of you will be excited to hear about. So it's standard across the range. It's not an option in any of the cars. It's standard across the range. And it's the idea that less is more. So in this mode, it's, a, it's like a single pedal operation, but it's a true single pedal operation where we actually are balancing the electric motor operation, and also including the friction brakes as and when it's needed to maintain the same level of performance. We do that on flat, we do that on grade. You go into San Francisco, that car will not roll back. You just lift your foot off the pedal, there it'll be. There's no games about it, it's very, very seamless, it's really confident to drive in the city. The other item uh, that's new is the Pro Pilot Assist, uh, which is a sort of what we would call a 1.5 level uh, of assistance from the, autom the autonomous vehicle level. And we'll talk a little bit more about both those in just a moment. So this is how leaf uh, the e-pedal works. It is actually a switch that's on the dashboard near the shifter. And it's a separate switch. You don't have to shift the, the, uh, the shifter itself. It's a separate switch that you pull. It will be next to what is the, the new eco button. So one is a button and one is a pull. So you will not get those two confused when you're driving it. You can switch the modes on and off anytime you choose. And basically it works, you guys know well about, uh, about the high regenerative motion. Um, so when you're coming down to a stop, you just back off the accelerator pedal. You can control the <laughs> level of deceleration by the, amount of deceler by the amount of lifting you do on your foot. Um, it's a bit more tricky than that though, because when we go up hills and down hills, we're actually compensating for grade and we're changing the shift map on the fly all the time. And then if you lift your foot off the pedal completely, the car will come to a complete stop transition to the friction brakes, which will then hold the car in place without using electric motor energy, and it'll just stay there all day. When you want to uh, proceed, you just tap into the accelerator pedal, the friction brakes will come off, the motor comes on, and it seamlessly will accelerate. It doesn't consume any energy when doing that. Question? Yes? Does it work just as well when the battery is fully charged? Great question. One of the questions uh, that someone had asked me previously is, why do you use the friction brakes? Well, there's a limit to how much battery charge acceptance, you can have it full state of charge, but we want you to have the same benefit of motion no matter what's going on with the car. We don't want you to have to think about it. High state of charge, low state of charge, it has the same performance, but we do it in a different way. At very high state of charge, to the extent that the battery can accept the charge, we will accept everything that the battery can. What it cannot do, we will make up for with the friction brake system <coughs> to give you the exact same deceleration profile as you would have at mid-range SOC. We do that until the battery state of charge comes down just enough, and as it comes down, we slowly more and more regeneration and less and less brakes. Does that also work during cold temperatures when the battery doesn't work? Doesn't down? matter the temperature, doesn't matter the state of charge, doesn't matter uh, the grade. So it works it the same way. Regardless of the yeah, it's tuned for everything. 
It also works with the vehicle dynamics control system so that if you're in a limited traction mode and as you slow down, it's through the front electric motor, there's only one, um, that may cause an instability in the car as you can imagine if it's, very li if it's a very loose surface. We uh, integrate the vehicle dynamics control system so that it'll blend in rear braking if necessary to, to achieve the same result. Up to the physical limit of what is possible from the grip conditions. What about emergency braking? The, the brake system has not changed. So this is an extra mode. It's not a mandatory mode. So you pull the switch, it works this mode. You don't pull the switch, it works just like the regular leaf. The brake pedal does the exact same thing it used to before. Even if it's in this mode, the brake pedal still does the exact same thing it used to before. So there's no difference in the brake system. It works exactly the same way. So if you just switch your foot right off the, it would just stop. Off the accelerator pedal? Yeah. Um, it, it's, it gets a bit complicated, but we actually step into it rather smoothly and gradually. So it won't be an instant, it won't be an instant hit. It progressively builds to the dis target deceleration rate you and then it'll hold that. Pedal. Yeah, you still have a brake pedal. That's still there. No I'm difference. just curious if you use it or not. Yeah, you can use it. There's, there's no reason not to use it, but you don't need to up to 0.2 G level of the deceleration rate as a technical level. Okay. And that's a nice, comfortable, moderately aggressive uh, deceleration rate. Above that, for example, Panastock, or if you, know, you kind of misjudged or something, uh, just use the brake pedal like normal. Yeah, it's still there. Good questions. Uh, this is the ProPilot Assist. This is what it looks like on the dashboard. You'll see this shortly. But what it does is like a uh, super smart cruise control system. So it works similarly to a cruise control system. You activate it the same way. You set it the same way. Uh, it's one of the options you can set in the car if you do or do not want to have steering assist. Uh, in the case of this, it's showing the little green steering wheel right here. And that case means uh, that the car has good enough visual condition on the lane markings, the vehicles around it such that it can actually do the lane centering for you. It's making the steering corrections for you. It'll keep the distance for you. If the car in front of you slows down, the car will slow down to maintain the distance. That distance is selected by you. It's that little dot, dot, dot that's in the middle. You can make that closer or further apart. Um, and you come to a complete stop if the car in front of you stops. When that car resumes, you'll resume with it. If you stop for more than three seconds, you just have to hit the resume tab and it'll, it'll carry you on. So it does lane centering. It's not intended to be a completely hands-free operation. It will drive the car. It's not intended to be hands-free. So we will give you reminders to, hey, put your hands back on the steering wheel after a few seconds. But it will, it is an assist. Okay. Let's go on to the next. Uh, this is uh, kind of just about the shape. It's, uh, new. it's more like regular uh, traditional vehicles. That's the image of this car is to be more familiar. familial. And let's go on to for those who are into more about the uh, bits that uh, you see inside rather than the bits that make it go. Um, the dashboard design is totally different than the previous one. Um, has a seven inch uh, design cluster meter, a new telematic surface, will support Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Uh, one big thing you'll notice is that we no longer have the double stacked um, speedometer and then the lower cluster. We've moved that together. Uh, many people have wondered why we went to an analog gauge in a digital car. The reason is that when you're driving an EV, you somehow lose that sensation of acceleration. You feel, the, you feel the torque, but it doesn't really translate to how you're used to. So for some people, they found that a little off-putting when they're going a lot faster than they expected they would be going. Uh, the, the speedometer gives you that kind of visual indication of progress. So we went back to that for that particular reason. Uh, no, it's, it's, a, it's a hard digital, I mean, it's a hard um, analog gauge, right? A digital version of it, yeah. Yep. Yep. Analog yeah, analog one's fixed. Um, we have changed the, the charging port, so instead of the door coming up like this, now the door is up like this, so it's much easier to um, open up the charging port. Another thing for those who may be interested is, this is hopefully proceeding, there we go. Uh, we have a new cord set, which combines level one and level two into one cord set. You can adapt it to the NEMA 1450 or your regular 120 volt well, outlet. <laughs> yeah. uh, so this comes with the SL, it's a new cord set, and it's available at the higher charge rate, so you can use that one in any, any device. So it comes with the car? Yes, it comes with the car, on the SL. <coughs> the SL. Uh, it'll do the full 6.6. Okay, so we don't have to do, a, a, you know, as in a separate unit, you can actually put this in the car as a portable unit, um, and it'll plug into a NEMA 1450 outlet or the regular 120. Okay. Again, oh, that's very spooky. 
<laughs> so funny you should ask that question because that's coming up. So uh, again, the word in your mind is value, right? We can do a lot of things in the world. It's how much, how much do you need? How much do you want to pay for? Okay? So the point of this car, the point of the LEAF has always been to bring mobility to the mass marketplace and that pricing point. So the, the goal of this car was to get it in at the $30,000 price point with increased range that has practical meaning. But we will have uh, options available for those that wish to go up a bit. So the basic LEAF S starts at, um, there we go, pricing. So I might add that um, the model year 18 LEAF is about $700 less expensive than the model year 17 LEAF, even though the range is up and about $4,500 worth of additional value items. So 40% increase in the driving range. The uh, electric motor is now 110 kilowatts versus the 80. Actually, technically speaking, it's the same electric motor. We've changed the inverter to a higher power inverter, but the motor is actually the same. It's been updated a little bit, but the basics are the same. Gives you 37% more power. Uh, E-pedal, as I mentioned, is standard across the range, as is forward emergency braking. That is also standard across every vehicle. Uh, and the seven inch uh, screen with the analog speedometer automatic headlights. So that's, that's the LEAF S package. Uh, the grade walk here, the SV. Model year 17 is 34.3, model year 18 is 32.4, so about a 5% cost reduction. Uh, has everything that the S has, plus CarPlay, uh, Android Auto, and the ICC system, Intelligent Cruise Control, which is what gives you that distance speed. Does the regular one have a uh, half charge port? Uh, gosh, I have to remember the final. I'm going to have to get back to you on that one. I don't remember the final configuration. <laughs> Tomasu, do you know that one? Okay, yeah. All right, so the SL grade on the S SV and SL, yeah? SV and SL, yeah. Uh, so the SL, the top's trim, uh, about 36.7 for the model year 17, going down to 36.2, so a little under 2% uh, in terms of cost reduction from the current one. Again, 40% more range, though, um, and about $6,500 in additional items. So the SV grade, which has items over the S, this is over the top of that. Uh, the Bose audio, blind spot warning, rear traffic, cross traffic alert, and then you get that mixed mode level one, level two charge set. Also has a round view monitor, which is currently an option on the, on the other one. Okay, uh, so importantly, uh, the reason why we're here tonight, the reason why this kind gentleman back in the back of the room, who you don't recognize, is Kamasu Livingston has joined us from the uh, Nissan, Nissan product specialist team. Um, the car is not available. The car is not available this month or next month. It was coming in January. But we have one here today because Kamasu kindly brought it for us. Um, however, better than that, uh, we have a, we have a um, we're pretty low tech at, at Nissan. We, we don't require you to give us $1,000 to reserve a car. <laughs> um, <laughs> we are not going to pre-fund our business plan with your money, tax-free and interest-free. So instead, if you'd like, you can just sign up and reserve. Simple as that. <laughs> but uh, better still, we actually have the ability to bring you the car. So we have this uh, uh, Drive and Discover program that we've launched in other cities. We've now added SAC, basically, to the city, courtesy of our ability here to do grassroots efforts. We've convinced uh, the powers of E to add Sacramento to that, to that uh, city. So we will have, uh, as needed basis for those who sign up for reservations, we will bring a car to you. Um, it's with one of the product specialists, probably will be a guy that looks an awful lot like him. Um, <laughs> <coughs> or one of his, or one of his uh, equally stylish uh, <laughs> colleagues will bring a car to you and you can do the test drive. You know, 30, 40 minutes, something like that, depending upon where we're going to be. And it's sort of like a concierge type of thing. It's not a related to the dealers or anything else. We will actually bring the car to you. The mechanism by which to do that is very simple. There's a reservation process. Mr. kamasu san here, he will actually show you how to do that. He will take your signups in a computer that's out in the back next to the car. Um, so we'll facilitate that for you. I think we've already started that activity. Uh, it's yeah. just sort of started within the last couple of weeks. Yes, we have. We're, uh, we're already rolling out Saturday, San Francisco, um, Saturday, 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 Saturday,
it's much better. Keep it trunk, yeah. Wipe with the trunk. I had the first one you gave us, right? Yeah. Yep. Ten. And I liked it a lot after a few years. I just would like that one. <laughs> but this one. I signed up for the test drive, but they're only in the candidate uh, parts at the moment. Uh, no, no. Are you here in Sacramento yeah. right now? Yeah. We're going to be doing some up here. When? Uh, we're working on scheduling now, mm -hmm. uh, but we'll definitely be coming up here. Yeah. Where does it say? Uh, it says shut that door. Okay. Shut that door. <laughs> oh, there it is. Exactly. The range, good. Wow, that's a very nice display. Mm -hmm. Got more color too compared to the old one. Yep. What um, a semi? Is it lane warning distance? Yeah, so the you have the profile and assist. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. It's engaged by, you first hit this button here, yeah. which brings the system online. Mm -hmm. And then you hit set. Set will lock in their current speed. Mm -hmm. Then you'll see an icon with a static vehicle, gray lines on the side of it, like mm -hmm. this. Yeah. And then you'll see a gray steering wheel. Mm -hmm. When the lines turn green, the conditions are proper for ProPilot assist to manage steering. Mm -hmm. When they're grayed out, it's not steering and it's only managing speed and distance. Okay. You control your range from the other vehicles by hitting this button here, mm -hmm. which is represented by the hash marks. Yeah. So, two, one, three, two, one. Okay. And then when it's tracking another vehicle, you'll see another vehicle placed up here yeah. to represent the car mm -hmm. in front of you. Now the lane warning, will it stay in the lanes automatically with... It uh, will. Um, you'll also get some vibration from yeah. the steering wheel yeah. if you attempt to change lanes yeah. without using your indicator. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's the indicator. It took me a while to get used to uh, use the indicator to not get the car upset. <laughs> well, it's, yeah. a, it's a safe habit. Yeah, I mean, no, it's, it's, it's good. Uh, no question. Well, thank you very much. Of course. <laughs> Is this an SL, Owen? This is a SL. <laughs> you are free to jump in the car with the Better not uh, stop. <laughs> Charging. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's charging. But instead of having just the adapter here, it has two separate cables. Two separate lanes. Yeah. Okay. And the one cable is much thicker, higher right. gauge. Right. Well, you don't even need an, uh, your own charger now. You can just. It's, it's not as high. It was only 16 amps. Oh, you said 6.6? .6? Yeah, no, no this, this, one, one, this one is. Yeah. Yeah, the this Audi one was only 16. Yeah. Six amps. But you have to. No, that's not it. Is it that one? Hey, the new leaf. 